Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 1. Today we'll start talking about one of the things that chemists care about most when they are studying new chemical reactions. How much energy does it take to make them happen, and how much energy can we get out of them? This is especially important when we're developing new fuels, so people developing environmentally friendly alternative fuels think about the energy of chemical reactions a lot. To understand this, we first need to talk about what energy is. Energy is actually a tricky thing to define, but you can think of it as the property of molecules that allows them to make things happen. What kind of things? Anything, really. You need energy to heat things, to drive chemical reactions, to move objects around. Basically, energy is needed to make anything happen. We can break energy down into two types. First is potential energy. Potential energy is the energy something has because of its location or because of its electrical charge. So for example, an object could have more energy in a magnetic field than it has when it isn't in one. It's the location of the object relative to the magnetic field that gives it more or less potential energy. We'll talk a lot more about potential energy in future videos, and it's something that we care a lot about in the course Physical Chemistry. The other form of energy is kinetic energy, and this is the one that we'll talk about today and in the next few videos. Kinetic energy is the energy that results from an object's motion. For example, here's a simulation of a bunch of gas molecules moving around in a box. The molecules in this sample of gas have kinetic energy because they're moving. If we were to also to apply a magnetic or electrical field to the gas, we could also change their potential energy. Let's be a little more specific about what exactly kinetic energy is, though. It turns out that there are two things that determine how much kinetic energy an object has. First is how fast it's going. That makes sense. The faster it's moving, the more energy it has. The second thing that matters is how heavy the object is, its mass. The heavier an object is, the more energy it has. This makes sense too. A bowling ball moving down a bowling alley can knock over pins, but a ping pong ball moving at the same speed couldn't do that because it weighs so much less. We can give the kinetic energy a number using this equation. The kinetic energy is one-half the mass times the velocity squared. We measure the mass in kilograms and the velocity in meters per second, and that gives us an energy in units called joules, which we symbolize using the letter J. So this tells us the kinetic energy that an object has as a result of the fact that it's moving. Here's one consequence of that definition of kinetic energy. Here are two samples of gas. They both have the same temperature because the molecules are moving with the same average velocity. But the sample on the left has twice as many molecules as the sample on the right. That means the sample on the left weighs twice as much overall as the one on the right. And that means the one on the left has twice as much kinetic energy, even though the speed of the molecules is the same on both sides. It turns out that the kinetic energy is related to the heat in a sample. Heat is a direct result of the motion of molecules in a sample. That seems like a pretty simple explanation of what heat is, but heat was actually really difficult to understand. Prior to the 18th century, people thought heat was actually a weightless substance of its own which they called phlogiston. When you burn something, they thought it got hot because the phlogiston was escaping from the burning material, and the flame you see is actually the phlogiston escaping the matter. Phlogiston was another one of those theories left over from the days of alchemists, and it wasn't disproved until the 1770s. And the person who finally crushed phlogiston theory was our friend Antoine Lavoisier, who we've talked about several times before. You might remember that Lavoisier developed the law of conservation of mass, which says that matter can't be created or destroyed. Lavoisier performed several really careful experiments and found that the mass of the reactants in a combustion reaction is the same as the mass of the products. There was no missing mass that could have been due to the phlogiston getting away. We'll talk more about Lavoisier's experiments in the next video. He did some fun and interesting science that really shows us how to be a good researcher. One last thing to know is that just as there's a law of conservation of matter, 
There's also a law of conservation of energy, which says that the total amount of energy is always constant. If one object loses energy, that energy must appear somewhere else. That's also called the first law of thermodynamics. A more exact way of saying it is, in a closed system, the total amount of energy is always conserved. We'll talk more about the first law of thermodynamics in the next video, and we'll also look at some of the most interesting experiments of Antoine Lavoisier and some scientists of the 19th century that you've probably heard of. So until next time, have a good week.